So I'm here with Michaela Austin, who's an undergraduate in industrial hygiene at the Brigham City campus. And she's been working with me on this topic, which you'll notice we kind of changed the title just a little bit. Rather than posing it as a question, we said, hey, it really is worth a thousand words. So the importance of image choice in the classroom. And we're so pleased that you decided to come and be with us today, right here at the end, before we go for the dessert social. So thank you for making that choice. Um, really what we want to be talking about in terms of, uh, of images is something that I think is familiar to everybody. I mean, we are in such a, a world that's just saturated uh, with images. And uh, you know, it, it tends to work really well for us, uh, especially in the classroom. I mean, how many times have you had a student come to you and say, you know, I'm, I'm a visual learner. These visuals really, really help me. And in recent years, our classrooms have become very well equipped with these lovely computers and these projectors that uh, have given us uh, the opportunity to produce really image-laden PowerPoints. And again, that seems to work quite well. But that got us wondering. We thought, how are we choosing our images? You know, what, what kind of imagery are we, are we really going for in our classes? And, and what kind of thought are we putting behind it? Uh, you know, is it just we're looking for the best example to illustrate a point? Um, are we really concerned with, oh, is it royalty free? Or how's the resolution? And we started asking these kinds of questions. Um, and what we want to do is just try to explore a little bit that importance behind making really conscious decisions about the imagery that we're using in the classroom. And we're actually going to start now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you about 30 seconds, and I want you to consider uh, this image. Uh, it's on the next slide, and it's from a flyer that we used at the Brigham City campus up till about, oh, maybe a year ago. Um, it was meant to advertise biology tutoring. So take about 30 seconds and look this over. Okay, now can I get maybe about three pairs, let's come back together as a group, get about three pairs who might be willing to tell us kind of what you took away from, uh, from this image? Yeah. We know this, that there are no females in that picture. Okay, no females in this picture. Not diversified. Not diversified. If you're trying to keep women in science, they need to be represented. Okay, trying to keep women in science, we need to actually put some in the picture. Um, another pair, want to share what you saw? Yeah. Okay, so not much racial diversity in that image, yeah. This is like a scientific lab where there's actual intense research going on, not necessarily an undergraduate student who's using the actual imagery. Okay. All right, advertising tutoring looks like there may be a little bit more possibly than tutoring going on. Yeah, did you have something? Oh, okay, one more. Any others? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's the same guy four, four times. Yep, they've all got their glasses on. Well, well, I appreciate that. So you're picking up on a lot of different things. I mean, are the activities being shown appropriate for what we're trying to advertise? Is it too distracting? Because, hey, they all got glasses, but hey, now wait a minute. This is science tutoring. These are all males, and now wait a minute. This doesn't look very racially diverse. Okay, we noticed a lot of things. Question is, does it matter? Now that's a question each one of us uh, may have an initial answer to. But what we're going to try to do here today is to make the case that it does matter. Okay? How we represent our field really does matter, even if it's just an advertisement for some tutoring to go with a class. Uh, the imagery that we choose in our classes can actually make uh, a big difference to our students. In particular, when the field that we're trying to represent visually is one in which certain groups have traditionally been either underrepresented or undervalued, such as women, such as minorities in STEM. So we're going to be thinking about this, uh, this idea that images matter uh, from a number of perspectives. Because when you say, what difference can it make, we need to kind of think across the board. Recruitment, retention, what difference might it make for students to feel welcome in a field, uh, feel like they want to continue on in a field, 
uh, to stay in a, a certain career? You know, what does this really mean for student success? And one major idea that we would like to put out there for you is that when you look at images like this, you know, there is a risk that we may trigger something that we call stereotype threat. And stereotype threat, if you're not familiar with this, it is an individual's uh, uh, concern about perhaps fulfilling um, certain expectations for their own particular group. Uh, stereotype threat is something that's been very well uh, researched and has been shown to be a cause of people underperforming, for example, um, in a number of scenarios, including in the classroom. We're going to go ahead and take three minutes and just watch a very quick introductory video about stereotype threat. Social psychologists have found that performance in any given situation may be influenced by the threat of being negatively stereotyped. Stereotype threat is disruptive and intimidating. The fear is that when facing a negative stereotype, one's performance will confirm that the stereotype is true. The anxiety that the stereotype fosters prevents people from doing their best. It's as soon as you're aware that you could be seen through the, the, the lens of a negative stereotype about a group that you're a part of, uh, if you care about that situation, you could feel some sense of threat that you're going to be treated in terms of that stereotype or perceived in terms of that stereotype uh, or in some way reduced to that stereotype. And it's, it's a kind of threat that, as you can tell from that, happens to everybody because everybody experiences, everybody's a member of some group that is negatively stereotyped. All groups have negative stereotypes. In an interesting experiment conducted by Dr. Jeff Stone, black and white athletes were instructed that they were going to be tested on a golf-related task. When I finish the instructions today, you'll be going into the adjoining room where you'll be given a standardized measure of athletic aptitude developed by sports psychologists and based on the game of golf. The test is designed to measure personal factors correlated with natural athletic ability, such as hand-eye coordination. Any questions about that? When a group was told the task was a test of athletic ability, the African-American subjects did better than the white subjects. When I finish the instructions today, you'll be going into the adjoining room where you'll be given a standardized measure of athletic aptitude developed by sports psychologists and based on the game of golf. The test is designed to measure personal factors correlated with ability to think strategically during an athletic performance test. Any questions about that? When told the task was a test of sports strategy, the white subjects outperformed the African-American subjects. In both cases, stereotypes triggered beliefs and fears in the participants that became self-fulfilling. The cute thing of the study is that he reverses the effect by, uh, in a different condition, changing the, uh, the label for the condition. Uh, in this condition, he says to, to them, this is a test of sports strategic intelligence. So there's a, t there's a, a stereotype uh, uh, that now is more likely to intimidate the African-American subjects in this experiment. And indeed, the performance reverses. Under that instruction, uh, whites outperform blacks. Uh, so yes, I think this kind of intimidation, it's a, it's a, 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 I think stereotype threat is, is a cousin to a much more general kind of reputational intimidation uh, that, that we can impose on people uh, and is imposed on us as, as a kind of regular feature of, of social existence. Now, what research tells us is that images can act as a trigger for stereotype threat. And I'm going to turn the time over to Michaela. She's going to tell us a little bit about what social psychologists uh, have discovered in this area. Well, thank you. Uh, so we wanted to look for studies that had ties to image use. And so we put some of our favorites together to share with you today. Uh, the first one we wanted to show you is this one. It came very close to answering our question about image use in the classroom. The researchers in this study wanted to look at the effect on textbook images in student comprehension. So to do this uh, study, they gathered ninth and 10th graders, and they were given an excerpt from a chemistry lesson. The information given to all the students was the same, but there were three different groups um, among those students who got different images. In a stereotypic condition, uh, students got 
only images of male scientists. In another, they got, in a counter-stereotypic condition, they got all images of female scientists. And in a third, they got mixed genders, where there was an equal amount of male and female scientists. Um, following uh, the test, or following the uh, lesson, they had 10 minutes to study this lesson but on their own. They were given a test uh, to test their comprehension. Uh, females scored higher when exposed to the all-female uh, images, whereas females scored lower when exposed to all male images. Uh, and, the, and scores were equalized when shown mixed gender images. This is important to our project because we see that imagery does create a stereotype threat and that by choosing diverse role models for our images, when we choose them for our classes, can give everybody the best chance possible at doing well in class. Um, following the line of stereotype threats some more, um, we have this, um, this study that wanted to see what the effect of role models were on female students, particularly the gender of their role models. In the case of this study, role models took the form of peers, teachers, and TAs, and in one case, um, a biography of a female given in a lesson. Now, it was found that when female students were given female role models, that the female students had increased implicit identification with STEM. They felt more like they belonged in STEM fields. They also had more positive feelings towards STEM. And they even exerted more effort on a difficult math test than female students that were given a male role model. Um, the interesting thing about this was that despite all this, the implicit stereotype never changed. Um, females still had the stereotype that STEM is an inherently male field. But I loved how the researchers put it that uh, the role model act as sort of, acted as sort of a metaphorical antibody to negative stereotypes in that the female could still have this negative stereotype about STEM fields, but um, the role model acted to protect their self-concept and how they felt about them being in STEM. All right, so stereotype threat is real and it is something that can impact our students, something we need to be aware of. But the good news, what this research is telling us, is there is some good news. Social psychologists are saying, hey, there may be some really easy and inexpensive things that we can be doing to help diffuse the situation, an inoculation, right, a kind of immunity that we can grant uh, to our students. But the question is, are we actually doing this in our classes? Right? Are we providing those metaphorical antibodies? Maybe, maybe not. Um, that is something for each of us to consider. Um, I mean, we know that I mean, as faculty, we're all human beings. And when we are uh, working on our classes, going into the classroom, preparing our materials all throughout, you know, what we bring to it, of course, are our own biases. Uh, and that is something that we also need to, uh, to think uh, a bit about. Uh, when we think about bias, keep in mind that you've got explicit bias and implicit bias. And what makes the difference here is really whether it's, it's conscious or unconscious. So explicit bias, just an attitude or a belief that we may have about some group, again, on a conscious level. So the example here for explicit bias being, I like whites more than Latinos. Okay, now this is going to be quite different than the implicit or unconscious bias, which is more of a, just an automatic association that our brain makes for maybe some group uh, with some stereotype, some particular attitude, uh, without us even potentially being uh, conscious of it. So an example is automatically sitting further away from a Latino than a white individual. Now, when we start to think about biases, because again, we all have implicit biases, and uh, we know that um, uh, these may uh, negatively affect our students. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, we usually hit a stumbling block when we start to consider it, because we say, now, wait a minute. I don't know that I have all these biases. I mean, I certainly am not bringing these, these I like whites more than Latinos into my classroom. Well, that's not necessarily what we're, we're trying to get at here. 
uh, we very often try to link this automatically with, you're telling me I'm prejudiced against my students? Well, no, we're, we're trying to get at implicit bias here. This is what we're, we're concerned about, these automatic associations. You could have, for example, an individual who may be white who says, you know what, I would have no trouble um, working with a Latino colleague. Uh, shaking a, uh, a Latino colleague's hand, or I would treat my la Latino students just as well as I would, I would treat a uh, white student. All right. And yet, people can have still implicit biases, these automatic behaviors that they may engage in. I come around the corner. I'm walking down the street. If I have a group of Latino youths approaching me, do I automatically cross the street? I clutch my purse more tightly to myself. Uh, if I'm in my car, do I automatically lock the car doors? Okay, these are some of these automatic associations that we may not really be conscious of that we're trying to get at because they may carry over into the classroom. So it's entirely possible to have implicit biases that may be very different from what your conscious beliefs are. Um, but again, implicit biases may be a predictor of behavior. So what we are trying to get at here is how do we become more aware of our implicit biases and what can we really do about them? Now this isn't a survey that somebody can give to you and just say, please self-report all of your biases. All right? Again, we're talking things that may be very unconscious. But probably the most famous test that is used to measure uh, uh, implicit biases is the IAT, this Implicit Association Test. And there are many different versions of this. There are versions for uh, gender and science, gender in certain careers, religion, um, uh, and so on, age, weight, many of them. But the way that they work is that they will uh, give you uh, a variety of concepts. Now, it may be black people, gay people, and then either an evaluation, okay, good or bad, or a stereotype, athletic or clumsy. And the computerized test will tell you for each condition, all right, on your keyboard, you need to press this key when you see this concept and this evaluation paired. And then when you see the other concept and the other evaluation paired, hit the other key on the keyboard. Now, making that move from seeing the pairings and pressing a key on a keyboard can be easier if you see a grouping that really matches your own personal associations. So what this test is really doing is measuring the speed of responses uh, and taking that to mean that there is an implicit attitude. So we would say that one has an implicit preference for straight people relative to gay people. If they are faster to complete the task when straight people plus good and gay people plus bad are paired together compared to when gay people good, straight people bad, are paired together. And I would ask you to, uh, to consider if you haven't taken one of these implicit association tests, try it out because you don't have to register anywhere. Um, it's free to do uh, and it really doesn't take much time at all. Now this is from Project Implicit. And they have given millions of these over the last 20 years. And they use these for educational purposes, but also research purposes. And one of their uh, really sobering conclusions is that implicit biases can predict behavior. This is a direct quote. If we want to treat people in a way that reflects our values, it's critical to be mindful of hidden biases that may influence our actions. So implicit biases can be a predictor of behavior. But again, there's good news. There's good news because research shows that these implicit biases are malleable. Now, that wasn't always thought to be the case. This was groundbreaking research. But there's a good body of evidence to support this now. And Michaela's going to walk us through, again, some of these studies. Yeah, there are a lot of studies right now that are showing um, the malleability of implicit biases. We've picked a couple today that, again, fit in with our theme of imagery. And We've found that in this study that we are able to uh, modify people's implicit biases just with image use. Um, in this one, for example, they used images of disliked and admired individuals to try and create a change in biases. 
Uh, for example, they would pair a, an admired black individual with a disliked white individual, somebody that people would recognize, such as you know, Denzel Washington versus Jeffrey Dahmer. And then in another condition, they might pair Tom Hanks with Mike Tyson. Um, things like that. And they found that in the pro-black condition, where showing an admired black individual, we were able to reduce the implicit racial bias. Now, they did this again, too, using age instead of race, using old subjects and young subjects. And they found they were also able to reduce a, an age bias as well. And this is great because it shows that you know, this can be taken beyond race. This can be taken into age. This could be even be taken into gender, too, and would be important for use in the classroom. Um, but are there any other ways we can use imagery beyond just slides, textbook <coughs> images? Um, what about mental imagery, for example? We believe that you know, this, this fits in with our idea of imagery used in the classroom, what we have students think about, what we talk to students about. Um, in this study, they, wanted, they give a, gave students a mental imagery exercise where they asked them to think of a, a counter-stereotypic kind of woman. Think of a strong woman, or to think of a stereotypic woman. Think of a weak woman, a princess, a Victorian woman. And they followed those exposures, the imagery exercises, with an IAT to try and measure if any biases had changed. And sure enough, the use of counter-stereotypic imagery, imagining a strong woman, uh, was shown to significantly re reduce implicit gender stereotypes in women. With the effect was reduced on women. Um, but interestingly enough, this didn't work in men. So this brought up a, point, a good point for me that um, we may have people that say diversity in imagery doesn't matter, maybe because it hasn't worked for them. Maybe they haven't seen it work before. Um, this research shows that they might, in fact, be dismissing something that has a proven means of reaching female students, even if it hadn't worked for them in the past. Now, one other question we had. You know, the study a while back, uh, two studies back, um, was using disliked white individuals along with showing an admired black individual. We wanted to know if there was any way we could do this without degrading anybody else. Um, and sure enough, we don't have to. Now, this study was done in children, but it still gets our point across that uh, positive exposure alone can give us a change in biases. Uh, 369 children, ages 5 to 12, they were told positive stories about black individuals, shown positive images, and following that, they were given a child-friendly IAT, which uses more pictures instead of words. Um, and the study found that exposure to racial, uh, that the exposure reduced racial bias without having to degrade anybody else. So that's good news, that we don't have to put other people down in order to get our point across. But again, it was children. So that brought up the, another question that what is the most effective way to reduce bias in adults using images? So, we have this one. Now I want to uh, preface this by saying that the authors of this study say that this is by no means all of our options. These are the options they have for now, and uh, they encourage people to continue looking for new ways to reduce bias in adults. But for now, they've taken this and done a review of what they think, for now, we have as the best methods for reducing bias in adults. Um, this one was, it was a large project. It had over 17,000 participants taken from the Project Implicit website that Dr. Abashi just mentioned earlier. And the mean age of the participants was 27.9 years. So we've got our adults now. Um, in the end, they found that the most effective strategies for reducing bias were exposure to counter-stereotypic exemplars. Much like we've talked about in the rest of the research we've shown you today, is that showing something counter-stereotypic, that seems to be the way to go for adults. Uh, with the most ineffective strategies being things like, oh, engaging others' perspectives, saying, why don't you try and look at it from their point of view? 
and also appealing to egalitarian values. Things like, we are all equal, so we should treat everybody equal. Now, those, those, are, great, those are great things, and I'm not saying that the, we shouldn't do those, but they were ineffective at reducing our implicit biases. Interestingly, those final two are also something we hear a lot in, a, in parenting, I think. And in fact, the re according to research, it might be better to do something like exposing people to counter-stereotypic exemplars instead of using that method that we hear all the time. Um, rather than try to explicitly change our perceptions. Okay, thanks, Michaela. Yeah. Now, we never have that much time in any of the sessions at this conference to be able to do things like say, hey, let's all take an IAT right now and then let's break out into groups. That would be wonderful, but uh, I'm going to, again, encourage you to, to try one it, or more if you've never done these. But I want to make this personal before we uh, adjourn. Um, because as USU faculty, uh, we need to be thinking about what does all of this, all of this uh, research mean for us. And what I'd like you to do is actually, again, pair up with your nearest neighbor and try to think about specific things that you could see yourself changing in your own classes uh, based on uh, what we've talked about today. So I'll give you maybe two minutes. Okay, let's go ahead and come back together as a group since we're just reaching about the end of our time. Uh, how did we do? What, what did you come up with? Were there any specific changes you could see yourself wanting to make? Okay. Okay, so move away from the clip art into real photos and with a mind for, for diverse images. Okay. Other ideas? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, is it bad then to use something that the majority of students would um, associate with? Like, for example, I just got done doing a lecture on our capacity in classrooms, and so I use a lot of LDS Well, I mean, I think we have to be realistic, which is, you know, what is the context? I mean, what is the lesson about? What is, you know, what is, what is the best picture for that example? Um, it may not be that always, uh, you know, it's going to be the best thing to go for the most diverse image possible. So we kind of have to take a real just common sense approach for it. But what we're looking for, really just striving overall to be looking for some balance. Uh, to be providing uh, all students maybe with an opportunity to kind of see themselves in whether it's an image or just a mental imagery like a biography that they're reading, an article that they're reading. Um, so it, it's not that you always must avoid, uh, you know, a, a non-diverse uh, uh, image, but just trying to strive for that balance overall. Any others? Oops. Any others? Yeah, one more. Mm -hmm. And she'll bring the poster in, and it will have, like, for example, Native American festival, and it will have some awesome feathers or different type of dresses or things on the poster. And I think in that way, she really expresses her admiration of different cultures and helps us to have opportunities to create those experiences ourselves. Well, and, and I'm glad you, you brought that up because there's so many different ways to do this. Now, I want to leave you with one more image, which is our new flyer for this year. Um, what do you notice about this? Just yell it out. Okay, there's women here, minorities. Um, who's missing? The males. So, in some ways perhaps better than the old one, but can we still do better? Okay, we, we may still have a ways to go from one extreme to the other. Maybe we try to find uh, something in the middle. Well, I, again, I want to thank you for your, for your attention today. What, what we've 
prepared, if you're able to do it, is just a, a quick exit survey. Um, because we'd actually really like to know if there are faculty on campus who'd like to participate in some research uh, related to this topic. And also, we do have our complete reading list for all of those articles with some additional suggested readings. So if you'd like a copy of any of that, uh, please give us your email on that exit survey. Or we do have a, um, just some paper up front here if you don't have a, a computer or tablet or anything with you. So thanks again. Thank you for your attention and participation. Let's go have dessert. Yeah.